Hey everyone, welcome to episode 43. My name is Kay Shivan, I'm the producer. Today's episode is with Rick Nason, who is an associate professor at Dalhousie University, where his research topics focus on enterprise and financial risk management, applied complexity science, financial crises, and more. He joins Sam to discuss his path from physics to finance, from working in industry to then in academia, and how students and recent grads can best, best set themselves up for their future, but most of all, how to stick to being who you are. Uh, it's a really great episode if you're interested in learning about what Rick feels his best and worst career decisions are, or to hear some rapid fire answers from him uh, based on questions Sam asked. Um, this is the episode for you. So with that, enjoy. Hey, Rick Nathan, thank you so much for joining me on our podcast. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so Interestingly enough, uh, today I had about 120 students, no, not really, 80, probably 80 students in my two classes, uh, 160 or whatever registered. And uh, I asked him, I'm like, hey, I'm having like a finance prof, like guru, superstar. Do you have any questions that I can ask him on the podcast? So I have like my list of things prepared. I know kind of where I want us to go in general. But at the same time, this is a podcast meant for management learners. So why not ask the management learners? So I just want to put that as a pin uh, for some anticipation. I will also tell you that I got three or four people with questions in class. And then since I've received about, you know, six emails and a couple of people in office hours who wanted to tell me one-on-one -on -one other questions for Rick. So are you ready? Let's fire away. All righty. Well, first, let's. I want to do a little bit of an icebreaker, especially because you just came back from Vegas. And so I know that traditionally what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What's one thing that's not going to stay in Vegas? Please share. Oh, that my wife won five bucks uh, uh, playing video uh, blackjack off of, uh, off of one dollar, albeit with, with my help. I mean, I... I don't know what you're teaching in those Dallas events, but I feel like this has to be a lesson in there sometimes. How to go from $1 to $5. Um, did she cash out right away or did she double down or was that like? You want to know, uh, uh, this is the honest to God's truth. She was so embarrassed about cashing it in that she actually gave it to someone in the lobby as we were checking out of the hotel. So she gave the $5 cash in because uh, she was too embarrassed to light up at the, at the cashier. So uh, my wife and I are not gamblers by any stretch of the imagination. That is that is amazing. Um, Eric and I, the first time we went to Vegas together, we um, we budgeted like you know our recreation money. We budgeted like our show money. We budgeted our um, our like food money, and we came back uh, with exactly one dollar, and it stayed on our bulletin board one U.S. dollar. And I was like so proud. I'm like that is amazing budgeting. That is like amazing. So man, if, if you go to Vegas on a budget, uh, particularly a food budget, that means that you must have starved. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh man, this is a long this is a long time ago but I, I will tell you that you know when we talk about cost and we talk about like decision making uh so he was playing in a poker tournament and we ended up having to stay a couple extra days because he made day two and then day three and I was like okay well I'll switch around the flights but there was two options one was to fly directly home in a flight like we had and it would have cost like I don't know, like just more money than we had. So like, absolutely not. Or we could take two flights or sorry, three flights to get home, 12 hours to do so. And we would get refunded our original flights. And these would cost us like 200 bucks. So we would net about $50 an hour. So not only did we sleep on uh, the floor um, from like, you know, 2 a.m. to like 6 a.m., but then we made $50 each an hour just by taking these flights home. And me as an accountant was super excited. And him as a non-accountant was like, why are we doing this? I don't understand. And all I could be like, it's like, we're earning money sitting here just in the difference of the cost. So it's interesting. Vegas definitely brings out, I think, uh, a lot of decision-making and a lot of like questions that we ask. Like, do I want to stand in line to cash in this $5? I would rather give it away than do that. Do I want to come to Vegas with a budget for food and starve? Well, possibly. Like it's, it's an interesting place with a lot of observations. Okay, last question about Vegas. Did you observe anything like where you're like, oh yeah, this is Vegas. Like it's something very Vegasy. Well, well, first I gotta give you my Scottish accountant story. Uh, we stayed in a very nice hotel room. We stayed at one of the casinos. Uh, we were there for an event, uh, which is hilarious, but I'll 
tell that to you when it's not recorded. Um, <laughs> I know it, it wasn't anything nasty, but um, basically 3,050 year old plus men trying to act like uh, cool 30 year olds, but in reality acting like eight year olds. Um, but every morning, uh, even though we we're in a very nice room, our room did not have a coffee maker. And the Scottish accountant in me refused to pay nine bucks for my morning coffee. So I walked to McDonald's every morning to get my coffee uh, for myself and for my wife. So I got up at five o'clock every morning, went to the 24 hours McDonald's uh, down the street and brought back uh, uh, two coffees. I love this. I know, um, I know just one other reason why we get along so well, because yeah, like, it's like, can you afford it? Yes. Do you want to pay that? No. <laughs> having, having, having said that, we did eat some unbelievably awesome food. Good. Maybe help. Well, that's, that's the difference between cost and value, yeah. right? If you don't perceive value in spending $9 plus, 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 plus on room service for a coffee on something that, you know, Crap should likely be there on your very nice room. Yeah, the value and lining, lining um, your what you spend your money on with your values, how you spend your time. Like that's when you kind of can get that alignment and I think be at peace with spending, you know, a lot of money on a dinner that you can be like, this is amazing. This is part of experience as well as like proudly be like, I'm going to walk to McDonald's at 5 a.m. for this coffee because you're not going to win. I love it. I love it. So, Rick, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on here, not only because I, think it'd be cool um, for our students to kind of get some advice um, and go down that road, but also because of me. I wanted to know a bit more about you. Uh, what was your life like? Uh, you know, what was your path kind of coming to academia? Because I knew, I know that you worked quote, in the real world. I know that it was in a finance role uh, and I believe it had to do with derivatives, but I don't know the exact particulars. And um, I'd be more embarrassed to ask you one-on-one, -on -one, but I'd really love to kind of hear that path on, on your way to academia. Uh, my path to academia actually started in grade seven. Uh, I can tell you exactly what I was eating. Please. It was a bacon, uh, lettuce, and uh, cheese uh, and tomato sandwich at lunch. Yes, it was cold. Yes, I know you're not supposed to eat, you know, bacon that's been sitting in your locker for several hours. But I lived a long way from school, so I was one of three kids that got to stay at school for lunch. And I was reading... I was doing my studying for physics and I read ahead about the Bohr model of the atom and I was hit by a thunderbolt, mm. absolutely hit by a thunderbolt. And that was the day I decided I was going to discover element 114. Uh, it never quite came to be, but my path was as a physicist all the way along. And, you know, that's why I'm ABD in physics. And however, I came to realize um, First off, I, I got married while I was uh, in grad school, and uh, my wife didn't want to live the wife of an unemployable spouse in the U.S. because of work visas and whatnot. So I came back to Canada, finished my Ph.D. in physics, which was an absolute disaster, but it was actually the luckiest break of my life mm. um, because it's becoming very clear that uh, given my age and given the demographics, uh, because of Sputnik, I kind of missed that Sputnik uh, era. And so everyone who was 15 years older than me became a physicist. So in about five years, there's going to be a massive retirement of physicists. So the only jobs in physics were basically to build bombs because everyone else was 40 years old, you know, uh, and, you know, had a 25 year career in front of them. Yeah. And so I actually became a tennis pro for a little bit, uh, which I loved, a uh, teaching pro, teaching pro, which is why I went to school for my undergrad in Texas. And then um, uh, uh, applied to grad school again to get my MBA. And uh, basically, and this sounds incredibly self-centered, but did an analysis and figured out my comparative strengths and weaknesses. And uh determined that derivatives was the place for me to go because at the time it was brand new. Uh, I understood it in my gut. And also all the physics that I've been doing actually lends itself very, very, very well. So I kind of jokingly or half jokingly say that I changed 
diffusion of radioactive gases into uh, a volatility of financial assets. And that's how I went into finance. But there's one little kink in the story that I have to tell you. You know, I was getting my MBA and it was at the end of the first year and I was going through all the round of interviews, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and actually doing quite well. And uh, I could tell you, again, exactly uh, more detail than you can imagine, but that morning I got three job offers uh, in capital markets, all of which were unbelievably fantastic. And actually, and we're going back a long time. Yeah, uh, much, yeah, yeah. Actually, much more than I'm making now as a prop. Wow. And yeah. my wife came and picked me up for lunch. And again, I could tell you exactly what we ate. We we lived in the third smallest house, rented the third smallest house in uh, London, Ontario. I know that because the only money we had was to drive around and try to find a place smaller than ours. And uh my wife came, and picked me up and said, you know, how'd it go this morning? I said, well, I got three job offers. So, you know, she was, hey, you know, we don't yeah. have to live penniless again. And I said, oh, by the way, uh, Dr. Shaw came to me this morning and asked if I'd be interested in doing a PhD in finance. Mm. And uh, my wife, uh, mid bite of the salami and cheese sandwich that she brought me to celebrate my favorite said, you know, uh, no matter what happens, you're going to be an academic. So guess what? We can be penniless for a few more years. And that's basically, I, I did do the PhD, but I made it very clear from the get-go of starting my PhD that I was still going to go to the real world, I into industry. Okay. Which if you've done your PhD, you know, is not uh, a great strategy, but uh, everyone understood and everyone supported that. Although I think that a lot of them hoped that I would switch, but I never did. And, you know, ultimately it paid off. Yeah. So that's really interesting because, you know, quote, typically um, uh, one path would be, you know, go through uh, academia, go through undergrad, perhaps uh, a master's uh, or straight to your PhD, uh, get your PhD um, and then, you know, get a prof role and stay there until yeah. you retire. Uh, another way is to go to industry and, you know, perhaps, you know, make your mark, uh, you know, come back and be like, okay, what am I, what am I missing? Or like having that career moment of like wanting to get back and then transferring. And so you did a hybrid, but quote, kind of backwards of that. Um, and you were like, hey, um, I really have these great opportunities. Um, I'm going to pause that. I'm going to do my PhD and then I'm going to go to industry where you worked for, and then came back to academia, which people don't typically then go back. Interesting. Okay. So I did not know that. I don't know what order I made up in my head, um, but I'm really interested. Um, so how long did you, I want to go backwards, forwards, and then recircle backwards. So how long were you in industry for, um, and what did that role look like before coming back to academia? Well, I started off at uh, Citibank. Um, uh, doing derivatives, uh, doing uh, equity derivatives, and particularly exotic derivatives and derivatives on exotic currencies, which was really weird uh, and really exciting. I learned geography really quick. Uh, and it was a whirlwind. Uh, and then totally out of the blue. I, I actually had something happen at work. Uh, yeah, let's dig into the derivatives. Yeah. That, that I prefer not to go into the details yeah. recorded, but something happened at work that I didn't really like. I was going to be put in a real ethical bind. Mm -hmm. uh, the short answer is, is or the short story is, is I shook hands with somebody on something and we agreed to something. And then I was told by the higher ups to uh, basically do something that I didn't think was 100% above board. Mm. And I literally went home on the train that night uh, and was almost sick to my stomach the entire train ride home. And got back to my apartment and this shows how old I am. There was on the answering machine, the light was blinking. Yep. And I, you know, uh, 
you know, picked up the tape message and it was Bank of Montreal offering me <laughs> the most unbelievable job on the planet. Totally out of the blue, totally unsolicited. I, you know, I didn't even know it existed. And that was to be one of their faculty heads at their brand new Institute for Learning. Oh. Now, uh, unofficially, my role was to be the derivatives, if I can say this, uh, bleep hole. You can fill in the three letter word in front of that. But, uh, uh, and, and also long story short, or, or to make it even more bizarre, I said, well, what you're offering to pay me is like nothing close <laughs> to uh, where I'm at. So we basically arrived at a deal where I'd worked three and a half days for BMO and Western came along and offered me another day to be an uh, adjunct uh, professor. Okay, okay. And so it was an unbelievable job. So it was one part uh, in-house professor, one part professor at Western, one part internal consultant, and uh, one part um, uh, think tank. Uh, it was just uh, an unbelievable experience. But again, part of the deal was that they had to put me back in the States uh, mm. after a period of time um if i can say this uh, said enough out loud uh you know the tax in canada is just the tax and wages in canada unfortunately are not competitive in all fields yeah okay and i don't think that's any big secret no you know there's pros and cons uh to working in canada one of the cons is the financial situation absolutely yeah. Anyhow, uh, BMO held their promise, and you know, two years later, I found myself as head of credit derivatives when we had no idea what credit derivatives was. Uh, the field was brand new. Uh, we were literally still trying to figure out how to spell credit derivatives, um, but it was fascinating being in on the very ground floor of what's now become a very important industry, although it's a lot quieter than it used to be. It still uh, underpins a whole lot of what goes on in the, for lack of a better word, plumbing of the financial system. Yeah. All right. So when you were um, not given, when you earned those three offers um, after your MBA, and then when you completed your PhD and received the offers to go to industry, uh, was there any difference in the in kind of the hiring process or the different opportunities that you were receiving or um, just anything that perhaps students would want to know about, you know, going from finishing your degree to going into the job market uh, in, um, in finance uh, that were any different between when you left for your MBA and when you were leaving from your PhD in finance? Yeah. Well, first off, I, I more or less hid the fact that I had a PhD. Okay, that's that's what I was going to ask yeah. is like, how relevant was your PhD? Well, how monumental was your PhD well, to helping you get the job? You know, here's how my kind of first, last and major job interview went. First off, um, when, when I got the three job offers, that was through uh, Career Services at, at Ivy, which is a machine. Okay. okay? Yeah, it's a machine. Uh, coming out of the PhD, I did not go that route whatsoever. And as I said, I was hired by Citibank and was so desperate. I didn't even get invited to the cocktail uh, party that basically, you know, the cast wiped everyone. I, I, I didn't even get past that filter. So I kind of moonwalked backwards into the cocktail party. And the thing is, uh, I knew exactly who I wanted to work for. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And anyone who's come to me for job advice knows about my staff the fingers question, which is if I had magical powers and could have you work for any person, that's mm -hmm. absolutely key, person, mm -hmm. okay, who would that be? And I knew the three people I wanted to work for. And actually, I got job offers on my own from all three of them. So taking us back, though, how did you know who you wanted to work for? Like, what kind of process did you go to kind of research those people? Uh First off, I know it sounds corny, but I kind of used a version of Porter's Five Forces. 
or yeah, no, a no. SWOT analysis if you want. Yeah. Uh, what do I like and where does what I like match up with my comparative strengths and weaknesses? Yeah. You know, obviously, uh, as an MBA student, I was five standard deviations out from the typical Ivy MBA student. Like, I mean, you know, what the hell? We, we got a guy who's a tennis pro who sold pharmaceuticals for, for a year. You know, what the, what the, you know, what the heck? And, you know, let me tell you about the interview and, th and this will, yeah. uh, this will tell you it. So it's Mike Splattery from uh, Citibank. And I pestered him and I pestered the three other people. By the way, I knew their assistants very well. They knew me on a first name basis. They knew exactly the minute I was going to call. Okay. I, I called them so much. Okay. So you got to know them straight up from calling them so much before. Yeah. And you have to remember, this is the days before email. This yep. is the day before okay. LinkedIn, all of that. Yeah. And I figured out who the three key people in equity derivatives were. Mm -hmm. I learned everything I could about their teams. By the way, no one at, at school wanted to go equity derivatives because derivatives was a horrible subject, you know, that, you know, everyone felt, my God, stochastic calculus. And, you know, your HP 12C was burning up after class. You had blisters on your fingers from, you know, working the the calculator and, you know, you had to do programming. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so, you know, I knew programming. I was doing a very quantitative thesis with some new mathematical techniques. Um, I was in a brand new area of research on volatility of financial assets, although ironically it was direct descendant of what I was doing on diffusion rate on gases. By the way, as a quick aside, if you buy or sell a house in the States, you get tested for radon. Uh, that whole process and the science behind that is me. Although I will say very quickly that having yeah. elevated levels of radon in your home, contrary to popular belief, is actually healthy for you. But that's an aside for another okay. talk. Yeah, we'll dig deep in that next part too. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, um, so Mike Slatter is coming to give a talk at the university. And uh, so he said, fine, I'll come by your office when I'm done. So as a graduate student at an office, I sat there patiently waiting waiting and waiting and waiting. And he was almost an hour late. He comes in my office. Sorry, I'm late. You have 90 seconds. Why the F should I give you a job? Uh, he used the word that I'm not going to use, yep. but you can fill it in. And by why, the time, finance? Was, why the finance? <laughs> yeah. He said, why the, yeah. Why the finance should I give you a job? We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. And I was steaming at the time. So I just let loose. I said, look, you know, according to Euro Money, you're the number one uh, uh, equity derivatives desk. And he guy goes, where the hell is this going? And then I go, uh, according to Risk Magazine, you have the best quant crew on the street, right? And also your traders uh, were the most profitable last year, right? And, you know, he's kind of smiling, going, you know, look, kid, you know, you're using up your time here. I go, can they talk to each other? And he kind of got a spark on his face. What do you mean, talk to each other? Do your traders know what your quants are doing? Do your quants know what your marketing people are doing? I go, look, I've got sales experience, albeit limited, uh, as a pharmaceutical sales rep. I did point out that it was limited. I know what uh, I know how to sell. Also, I sold vacuum cleaners in in uh, high school. That actually was the best learning experience of my life. Yeah, I, I go. That. I know how to. I know how to sell. Secondly, I'm doing a very quantitative PhD. I know what your quants are doing. Third, all my work in graduate school has taught me the ins and outs of trading. I know what your trading traders are doing. Uh, I can be a translator for all three. Don't you think that has value? By the way, I think I have 20 seconds left. Do I have an effing job? <laughs> Uh, he almost gave the exact same reaction as you <laughs> and walked out. And the next day I got a fax to uh, where that some plane tickets were coming for me to do interviews in New York. Wow. Uh, for the interviews in New York, I had 12 interviews that day. Uh, the grand total of all 12 interview interviews added together lasted maybe 35 minutes. So if you had to kind of change that or operationalize that, it would be 
be ready to have very little amount of time to succinctly get your point across. I had an elevator pitch without knowing what an elevator pitch was. I I knew, again, because of this SWOT slash Porter's analysis that I'd done previously, way back when, um, I did my research on the company. um, And I gave a very short, concise, to the point elevator pitch. But the key point is they didn't have a job. They didn't have an opening. They weren't even looking for anyone. Yeah. But the point is, is if you know what you want, and if you know why you have a comparative and a competitive advantage for that position, guess what? You know, all the other people, you know, are lining up. You know, I told the story at Bank of America where I was involved in the hiring. We got 8,000 applications for, you know, 300 jobs. Yeah. But of those 8,000 applications or of those 200 jobs, 190 of them were de facto already placed before the job announcements went out. And so knowing what you want, knowing why you want it, and knowing what your comparative and competitive advantages are, that is something that very few people do. You know, there was no resume involved. There was no cover letter involved. There was, yes, a lot of talking to EAs, mm-hmm. um, you know, getting the executive through assistance. the barrier. Yeah. Uh, literally, the only time I met HR, and it was kind of humorous, was uh, my first day yeah. when no one told me that I had to whiz in a bottle. And of course, being me, being nervous going in on the first day to orientation, you know, I relieved myself before going into orientation. All of a sudden, they hand you the cup. And, <laughs> like, <laughs> And so yeah. all during the introductory speeches, I'm up there at the water fountain drinking water <laughs> like crazy because I say, oh, my goodness, you know, here I am my first date. I fail because I can't whiz in a cup. But, hey, you know, like he's holding man, back. I, I, mean, I, I, I hope people are, are, are listening to this podcast while watching while watching something else that are distracted but anyway, no you know, no this is I no don't. this is the these are the gold nuggets like the things that you can't yeah the things that you don't learn uh in the textbook the things that you don't learn on any other like uh podcast don't learn my grammar so one thing you've connected with um that sounds like something that i've said in the past is your value is when you provide um you know marginal benefit above your marginal costs um, and when I say marginal, I mean like, man, like make that as big a gap as possible. Because oftentimes, like my accounting third and fourth years, I uh, tend to ask them what job security is. And um, I get a lot of answers that are buried. It's like, oh, I, I apply for some role and they give me a job. I'm like, oh, is that secure? And unfortunately, I left them over Christmas one time with this answer. And I'm like, no, your job security is not somebody giving you a job. Your job security is your ability to add value and go out and prove that in the marketplace. And somebody will pay for that. Uh, and if you can't, like you said, if you can't you know, speak to your value, if you can't show your competitive advantage relative to the market conditions, then you, know, you have to work on your job security. Yeah, I, I'm going to disagree with that. Yeah, please. I'm, I'm going to tweak that slightly. Yeah. You know, one of the things that students are constantly told is show your value at it, show your value at it. Mm-hmm. I hate to tell you, you are a huge cost center for the first five years of your career. Yeah, you are an investment. Yeah. You are a cost center investment. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so instead of value, show your potential. Yeah. Ooh, I like that. Okay. Yeah, no, I will I will um, tweak that. You know, virtually, you know, when, when I showed up the first day, holy smokes, you know, to to quote Junior Soprano, you know, what I didn't know wouldn't f- fill a book. It would fill many, many libraries, okay? Yeah. And it was the potential that counted. But what I've learned is for the really good jobs, for the really good jobs, it's not what you know that counts. It's the passion that you have that counts. Passion trumps talent each and every day. You know, I, I use I use Brad Marchand and, and Wayne Gretzky as examples. Wayne Gretzky, perhaps not such a great example because no one knows who Wayne Gretzky is. But Brad Marchand had no talent. You know, basically, he 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 was never selected for any team really whatsoever. But just through sheer grit and sheer passion, has become a superstar. Mm. And 
you know, <laughs> the the number of people who have more talent than me is basically everyone in the planet. Okay. Yeah. No, no, I, and I nod and I don't nod. Yes. No, because we are seeing the realized potential now, but early on in the days, the value was that, that unrealized potential that, you yeah. know, however you want it to find it. Okay. Interesting. But it was the passion. Here's yeah. the thing. If you have the passion and if you truly understand yourself and understand what your passion is, not a dream, not a wish. Like, for example, I'll, I'll pick on investment bankers for a second. Sure. So, so if you're listening to this and you're an investment banker, just shut your ears for a minute. But everyone says, ooh, I want to be an investment banker. I want to be an investment banker. And they have no sweet clue what an investment banker does. Please, yeah. And almost always after six months, about half the students that become investment bankers call me up and say, Rick, oh my God, I made no mistake. Oh, yeah. no. And, um, you know, there's always going to be bad days. But if you're truly passionate about it, you don't have to worry about what your sales pitch is. Mm. It, it's you. Yeah. It, it's you being you. You know, you don't have to worry what's on your resume. The only question I ever got asked on my resume, the only question I ever got asked was what does summa cum laude? <laughs> yeah. Okay. But it's interesting because there is that barrier of how do we get in so that we can talk about a resume or we can cut, come in and like show that enthusiasm. And if there is that, you know, as you said, there's all those hundreds of jobs, all those thousands of applicants, so most of those jobs are already spoken to. How um, it's, it's laying the foundation through things like, you know, back in the day, it was emailing or sorry, uh, phoning uh, the admins. It was showing up to all the networking. Um, well, how would you tweak that approach as far as advice to, you know, third, fourth, even first years? Like what can first years do to kind of take your approach and show that enthusiasm so they don't become a resume on a pile, but they become an enthusiastic, like, you know, um, person in front of them? Well, first and foremost, uh, burn your resume. Okay. My advice to students is you never, ever, 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 ever show your resume to someone until they explicitly ask for it. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, secondly, Google yourself. Mm. What comes up? Because the first thing that happens, again, um, with all due respect to MCS, if a job is posted, if a good job is posted, the odds are very, very, very high that that job is already spoken for and that job is posted solely for legal reasons. Okay, that's a possible, yeah, possibility. Okay, later I can go through, you know, from my side of it back when I was on the hiring, how and why that works. Yeah. Um, so the people that you're networking with and the people that you're talking to, um, you're there not to get a job. You're there to get information and to help people. Whenever you go into a networking situation, be thinking not about yourself, being thinking, how can I help this person? Even if it's, you know, if I can use the phrase dog poop sniffing, <laughs> even if the job is for dog uh, poop sniffing. Yeah, yeah. How can I help that person? Even though I have zero interest in this job. And then, yeah. you know, send them an article, send them a link. Um, mm -hmm. make an introduction for them later. What happens is students do it backwards in my experience is they, is, you know, they start out, you know, I want to be X. Okay. And they're not seeing any job opportunities posted for X. And, but eventually they get a little panicked and they see a job posting for dog poop sniffer. Yeah. And they convince themselves, ooh, I always wanted to be a dog poop sniffer, even though that was the last thing in the world that they wanted to do. So again, it goes back to first starting with, where do I have a comparative and competitive advantage that matches up with my goals, values, likes, and interests? Now, not every job is, is gonna be you know flowers and sunshine and no. butterflies and all of that. You, and you're never, ever, ever going to find the perfect job. But the perfect job, if we talk about, you know, in mathematical terms, the per, if the perfect job is there, there's a thousand jobs that are ever so close to it. 
Well, and it kind of goes back to like when you went to Western, you had kind of five days and, you know, a day and a half here, but four different really roles in which you kind of created your own dream job in a sense by using career capital. But earlier on in your day, yeah, you might have to make some compromises and or, you know, just see right below what is stated. You have to be a little bit creative. Yeah. And, you know, as a first year or even a second year student, when you're going on your first or second co-op, the reality is, is you might not have two sweet clues what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You, you really might not have two sweet clues what you want to do. And that's fine. Uh, then use your co-op to do something that um something that is going to stretch you something that is going to be unique and novel so i, I went into pharmaceutical sales kind of out of desperation okay. okay i went into vacuum cleaner sales totally out of desperation but that's another story that we could talk about behind the scenes but both of those proved absolutely critical for me and the point is, is the best way to figure out that you're supposed to run due west is to run due east. The point is, is to have a goal. Yes. If you just sit there and wait for stuff to happen to you, well, unless you're incredibly lucky, you're going to be waiting a boatload of time. Completely. No, um, people tend to think, um, and you know, you being a risk expert, people tend to think, oh, if I don't move, I can't get hurt. But no, inaction is a choice. Uh, just like action is a choice. Like we're always making choices. We're always, you know, taking on risk and it's better, like you said, to kind of go towards something. Uh, the human brain has this awesome ability to rationalize after the fact. So, you know, whatever choice you end up making, your brain will protect you. Not only will it actually be okay, but like you will know that it's okay and you will rationalize. And that experience will be something that you can bring into your next experience versus saying, well, I didn't do anything because nothing came my way, right? Like that's yeah. a horrible story to show initiative. And virtually any job, even dog poop sniffing, yeah. will, will teach you things that you can use later. I'll, you know, my first real job, you know, I just dropped out of uh, physics was with Eli Lilly. And of course, you know, I've been a tennis pro, but I won't call that a real job. Um, so Eli Lilly, the pharmaceutical, um, the you were that, pharmaceutical that was the pharmaceutical company. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I went and everyone was going through was either an MBA or pharmacist. And here's me, a uh, tennis pro with ABD in physics. And AL, you know, I made it to the final set of interviews, and it was the managing director. Um, Harold Ford was his name. He was from Boston, and he spoke with a really thick Boston accent. And he goes, and by the way, this was before business school, you know, before anything. And he goes, and, and I can't do a Boston accent very well, yeah. but I, I wish I could, but he goes, Rack. People here seem to really like you, but I can't figure out how we will use a physicist tennis pro. <laughs> okay, time for the elevator pitch. <laughs> and again, not knowing what an elevator pitch is, as yeah. I said, the job, as I understand it, is mainly dealing with uh, physicians and with lay people who is for selling a uh, human, uh, genetically engineered um insulin and uh, human growth hormone i said so part of the job is dealing with highly trained scientific minds i go how many people do you have that have read the number of scientific papers i have and also you know i've taught physics do you realize how hard it is to teach physics to lay people and to get them to understand and to like you and you know, I've taught physics, which is a very scary subject to people, and, and they like it. And so that would help me dealing with the general public and, you know, conferences and whatnot about dealing with diabetes, which is a very scary subject. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, I go, look, you know, I don't know anything about pharmacy. You know, I don't know anything about the pharmaceutical industry, but you know, I've, I've done stuff in the past that's outside of my comfort zone. And guess what? I came through the other side and I think I can come through here too. Potential. You sold your potential because you yeah. knew your potential and your, val your value. Sure your I knew my potential, but you know. Fair. 
Fair, but you knew what your strengths are. You knew that you've accomplished things in the past and you were very open and honest with it. You weren't telling them guarantees. You weren't like, oh, I know everything about the pharmacy. You were very open with what you didn't know and very open with how you could add value. But but also for students on the co-ops, it's learning mm -hmm. from the co-ops. It's not learning yeah. the X's and O's of the co-ops. It's uh, keeping your head up, head up and looking around while you're on your co-op. And every experience can be pivoted, if yeah. that's a word, yeah, yeah. okay? And it's learning how to pivot your experience that I, I believe is crucial. You know, there's the old story about, you know, two people that work at a job for 10 years. You know, one person, you know, has 10 one-year experiences yeah. that they just replicate again and again and again, while the other person is constantly growing, stretching, looking beyond, and so at the end, even though they both worked for 10 years, one person only has one year of experience, whereas the other has 10. Yeah. Yeah. What are you, what are you, what are you gaining from this experience? What can yeah. you bring with you in your toolbox and what can you apply in the future? Yeah. I love that. Um, so I did have one question that came through and they wanted me to ask you, what was one uh, decision that you made at um, the beginning or even just, you know, relatively early on for when you started in financial markets that you are like, thank you, younger self. Good job, younger Rick. Uh, and then I think, you know, what the follow up will be. It'll be like, what's one that you're like, Rick, maybe we shouldn't have done that one. Um, you know, some advice that if you could go back and give it to your younger self, you would. Yeah. The second question is easier than the first. Um You know, part of the thing that I'll put, pat myself on the back for was um, saying yes to every everything that came in front of me. Yes, with enthusiasm, I'm sure. Yeah. So, like, for example, at the Institute for Learning, I had a dream job. It was awesome. So my one advice is don't get your dream job early in your career because it will spoil for the rest of your life. I had a dream job. Um, I, and I loved it. But, but it was relatively limited. And then they asked, hey, do you want to be in charge of this new thing called credit derivatives? I was like, what the heck is that? Well, we don't really know. Um, well, what's the future for it? Well, maybe two weeks, maybe a month. And, uh, <laughs> or, or, you know, uh, yeah. maybe a nice full career or, or maybe having the entire market blow up in 2008, which, by the way, was actually a godsend for me. Um, it, I, I you know, be, because guess what? I was the one person out of the industry who knew what was going on in the industry. So uh, that that's very, very, very valuable. Um, and, and so I would say the one thing I'd pat myself on the back for, and, and I owe my wife a lot of credit for this, okay? Because, you know, we married very young um, and, uh, you, you know, we had two young kids and, you know, when we left New York, we took a huge cut. I took a huge cut in pay. Okay. And, um, and then, um, you know, going into credit traders, it was a big risk, mm -hmm. but uh, they, they asked me if I wanted to go to Singapore or uh, do credit traders and um, Singapore probably would have been the more traditional role to take yeah uh but i took uh predators which is something i knew nothing about no one knew anything Nobody, about yeah, yeah, yeah. and basically jumped off the cliff and you know tried to build wings on the way down and uh you know you referred to it earlier our our, our brains but i would say ourselves um are more resilient than than we believe yes and if you have that faith in yourself, developing that faith in yourself, if you learn nothing in school, learn how to learn and learn how to have faith in yourself and learn how to have faith in yourself that you can adapt. So that would be the number one. Now, the second question is actually the reverse of that. Yes. Okay. Um, when I left BMO, I had two positions, again, that were offered to me. By the way, again, none of these were advertised. Uh, both of them came to me. I didn't come to them. Okay. 
and which again shows the power of implicit networking. Again, this was in the days before LinkedIn. Oh yeah, implicit networking. And also that you're interviewing for your next job while you're working your current job, because yeah. if you're good, people will hear about you and hear about your skills yeah. and want to be attracted. And, and I wasn't interviewing. By the, by the way, the, the Bank of Montreal job came totally out of the blue. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I never saw that coming. No, but I guess, I, sorry, you're like interviewing kind of in, implicitly, like your your brand is your hard work and people people hear about you and people yeah. People talk. It's, it's a smaller sometimes industry. People hear about me. It's not always a good thing. Yeah, yeah I, I, <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> but um, so uh, basically, I'd gone with the credit traders gig as far as I could see at BMO. And uh, the reality was, is I was looking around in BMO for, for something, but uh, two things came to me from the outside. And uh, one of them was an easy job that I knew I could do, you know, falling off a horse, okay, blindfolded. And the other one was scary as hell. Mm. And what I did was I took the the easy job and I will go to my grave regretting that. It's not my podcast, but I have been there, done that, and I hear you. It's... Yeah. How did that make, like, when did you realize, like, when did you start, you know, quote, regretting it? Or when did you start being like, oh, gosh? Um, actually, pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that's what led to me ultimately becoming an academic. Okay. Because so uh, when my wife and I sat in that car, okay, I said that w we agreed that I would be in academia by the time I was 50. Now, albeit we shifted that time scale forward quite a bit. I'm not that old. <laughs> okay. um, although most people think I am. Um, people think anything over 25 is old, sometimes in our yeah. audience. So don't just let, let you put that scale there. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and, and, uh, uh, that's when we went to what we said that we we're going to do long term. So even with that, there's still, there's still options. I think sometimes we tend to figure out like, oh, there's, you know, if there's two forks or something and we make a turn, like that's it, that's over. But it's like, no, there's, you still have the tool belt. You still have your network. You still have your skills and you still have other dreams and hopes and aspirations and goals that you want to achieve in life. So you make the best out of every decision. And I'm so glad that our, our paths kind of came, came together because you are definitely one of the bright, loud, um, uh, welcoming voices to the faculty as, as a new faculty from industry, um, albeit accounting. So perhaps, um, you know, we're friends or foes, but it was really welcoming to have you um, kind of invite me into the faculty. And uh, do you remember when we went for brunch at, um, oh my gosh, at uh, the Black Sheep? Of course. Are you going to be mad if I embarrass you just like just a little bit? Okay. I've, I've got two daughters. I'm used to being in there. Okay. So I'm so curious. Um, as we're sitting at brunch and we're talking about pedagogy, like we might do some like things together in the classroom. Um, the people next to us, um, so some very well-dressed businessy type, like men aged like 40 to 55 kept looking over at our table. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then as we got our bill and we're getting ready to wrap up, they said they stopped us. And um, and I say us, I mean you, and they were like, are you Rick Nason? And at this point, I was like, oh my gosh, Rick has fans. And a table full of them started asking all these questions. There was lots of handshaking. And I am just so, so curious. What element of your you know, past or present life were they, if you even remember, because I'm sure this happens like not, not the only time. Um, but yeah, how did they know you? And, and why were they so jazzed to meet you? I have no clue. <laughs> Okay. Um, you know, I do. I, I do have a little bit of a similar story, um, uh, but it happens in Toronto. Okay. Um, for, for, first off, I can literally go around the world in financial centers, and uh, more common than, and you're you're going to think I have an eagle the size. No, no, no. Of, I... of Halifax, but um, people will scream at me, "Hey, Rick." 
I'm ecstatic. And that's because in my classes, I always have a tradition of trying to wake people up. When I say, are we happy, happy, they're supposed to respond in unison. We're ecstatic. Um, uh, in Toronto, I was supposed to do a, a gig um, a, a, for one of the major banks. And the chief risk officer asked me to come in and do a series of seminars for their staff. And in Toronto in particular, but also lesser extent in New York and Chicago and London, et cetera, I've done a lot of training of derivative traders. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, unfortunately, that's kind of a career that's gone away the dodo bird because of automation and, you know, robots, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there are, you know, at this time, and we're going back about 10 years now, there's a lot of people who are in capital markets who, in one way or other, see my face. You know, before going to meet the CRO, um, I had to meet with HR, who never met me. Again, I was hired to do the series of gigs by, by the CRO. And so anyhow, uh, we agreed to meet at a coffee shop. So I show up at the coffee shop in my standard bow tie, which I should have worn today, sorry, apologies. Yep, yep. Um, and, uh, and the three people from HR sit down, I can see them go, holy smokes. I mean, we can't take we can't take him to meet the CRO. Like I mean, there's just no way. And so anyhow, as of course in Toronto, HR is you know three buildings over, and so we start trooping over. Nurse will go, God, like we can't take him to see the CRO. Yeah. We can't we can't take him to the C level floor. Well, we're all going to get fired. They all know. Way over, I had six people stop me to talk, and you know one person screamed down the street, Rick, I'm excited. And in the elevator up to the floor, two other people got in and, you know, talked quite nicely with me. Then we got to the executive floor, the mm. C-level floor. And they realized that none of them uh, knew the number of the EA. While she's walking down the hall, she goes, Rack, we're expecting you. How are you doing? Uh, uh, they kind of, yeah, she took me in and kind of left them in the hallway. And then we go and we're walking down the corridor to the CRO's office and he pops around the corner, Rick, great to see you again. And we start chatting. So um, the point is just be yourself, yeah. you know? Uh, you know, maturing is something I'm not very good at. You know, I'm still a 12 year old kid. My wife will tell you that I'm still the same 16 year old kid, albeit with less hair. Uh, on our very first date, funny story, very first date, I I had hair at the time, same length as now, albeit it wasn't white. And she pulled it back. She goes, you're going bald. That was our very first date when we were 16. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. And to think that I have actually asked her out on a second date is unreal. But anyhow. Um, you know what you're getting in for. Straight shooter. Well, yeah. I must have been really desperate at the time. It, it's just being yourself. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm passionate about teaching. Uh you know, my wife and I discussed that I was always going to be a professor someday. Um, but having said that, you know, I'm still struggling with what are the next three phases of my life? Mm. You know, I'm not done with my career by a long shot. Uh, you, you know, I have various outside interests. Um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, teaching is something I, I, I really enjoy. Hopefully, students realize I have a passion for it. Um, and But yeah, just be yourself. E everyone's so busy learning, trying to be someone that they're not. And that's, you know, if you're that good at it, go to Hollywood. Mm. Yeah. Um. Sometimes I heard early on from my parents, if you, if people like you for who you pretend to be, like it's better to be hated for who you are than liked for who you're not. Because if they, if they like you for somebody else, you're going to have to pretend to be that person all the time. And then you're going to have to wear different masks. So mm -hmm. I love, I love that the Rick that we see on the podcast is the Rick that was on Bay Street uh, and walking down is a Rick that we see in class um, and the Rick that you're going to get. And like, I think authenticity is a high value for me. And I think that translates well to the students. But again, you know, let's, 
let's not be around the bush. Not everyone sends me a Christmas card. Yeah, but if you stand, um, you know, if you stand, what is it? It's like if you stand for, I don't, I forget what it is, but yeah, like it's, it's part of the price of doing business about being yourself, and at least you can look at your mirror in the end of the day and but, be but, okay. Well, I, I actually, you know, on that note, I look at the end of the, I look in the mirror at the end of each day, and generally, I, I cringe. Oh my gosh, Josh. Okay. I'm going to, I know we're getting close to the end. Do you have like just a few minutes to go a little bit over and I'll rapid fire some things at you? I'll okay. rapid fire answer. Okay. So one student wanted to know if you ever um, struggled between accounting or finance. Um, I think I know the answer, but I'll let you take it. Uh, never. Um, I even took extra, I even sat in on extra accounting classes when I was uh, teaching at, at Ivy. Uh, I still don't know the difference between a debit and a credit. One's the door and one's the window or something. One's the door. Yeah, you know, I still don't know what the door and the window is. But, but you um, know, ha having said that, I, I think I'm very, very, very good at ripping apart a company's financial statement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the knowledge there, there, will be there yeah. regardless if you attain it from the finance or the accounting section. Yeah. yeah. No, for sure. Um, and then let's see. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, somebody would like to know, just in general, um, big buckets, and you know, I know that they're Googleable, but it's nice to hear from a reputable source versus you know what you find on different glass door. But in general, like, what are the main kind of types of buckets of jobs that students might be able to go in, and like, what is the lifestyle and the financial rewards that could be with them nowadays, and is that even feasible? Um, I did promise that I asked, and I think it's a good thing to ask because I know what it is in accounting, I just don't know what it is in finance. Um, you know, I'm probably not the person to ask of that now. Uh, I, I, and also it, it, it's very different from my day. Yeah. Okay? Sure. Uh, I was very lucky in terms of my timing, uh, when I got in and where I got in and how I got in, um, I've been a very, very, very lucky knock on wood, uh, throughout my career. Uh, having said that next to being a professional athlete or, um, you, you know, or a Hollywood star, there's very few careers that you can uh, take with as little talent as you can finance and do as well as you can in finance. Okay, fair. That's definitely uh, food for thought. Um, something that I like to ask all my guests, and I'll give you a moment, this isn't really necessarily a rapid fire one, but is about the definition of success. Um, so I would, I would love to know if you're willing to share and as like yeah. with anything else. Definition um, of success is seeing all of my daughters, uh, rug, almost all of my daughters rugby games. Definition of success is sitting down by the lake, feeding the ducks. Definition of success is knowing that my family is clothed, clothed, housed, and fed. De definition of success is, although I cringe at night when I look in the mirror, realizing that at least I tried. Uh, might not have implemented all that well, but at least I tried. Um, definition of success is that you showed up. It, it's not, it wasn't always pretty. It wasn't always perfect, but you showed up and you tried. I love it. Uh, I, I Just to continue, I, I stress to my class that the, uh, the goal in finance in the textbook is to maximize wealth. Okay, uh, that's actually a bastardization of the economic theory. The economic theory is to maximize utility, which we then shorten to maximize utility wealth because we can't really measure utility. And then which we shorten to maximize wealth. The real theory is to maximize utility. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, having a student Having the light bulb come on for a student, man, I don't know how many shekels that's worth, but it's worth a hell of a lot. Absolutely. Rick, one last thing, your elevator pitch equivalent of advice to management students, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, as they're leaving Dow, one thing that you want them to kind of remember, take with them and own into the future. Um, learn how to learn and learn how to take risks. Okay. Uh, my definition of risk is risk is possible that bad or good things may happen. 
Of course, my field is complexity, and my next book is tentatively titled Muddle, which is about VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Uh, learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, you are, for students of Dow, I'll put a little plug for Dow, uh, or you're going to a good school, you're going to a school where by and large, I think that we have uh, professors that actually give a hoot, okay? Uh, that's probably, in my mind, uh, the best value of Dow. I realize I'm critical a lot of times of, of some of the things that we do at Dow and some of the things that, that, that people do at Dow, but ultimately, uh, by and large, Dow has a set of professors who care. Take that caring and Learn to learn. Uh, knowledge is an almost useless commodity. Again, students who have taken my class have heard me say numerous times, if you know everything that there is in the finance textbook, you're worth $225. <laughs> okay? Uh, your job, your career is going to be something that you cannot in your wildest dreams imagine. Uh, the career of most of our students, uh, the job that they're going to be doing 10 to 15 years from now actually currently doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay. So you can't even define it. You, uh, it's how you connect the dots of your knowledge that count, not the knowledge that counts. It's how you deal with uncertainty. It's how you deal with volatility. Coming back to the resilience, it's, it's how you create your resilience. It's how you create your self-esteem. Yeah, guess what? No one is is more ticked off at themselves than me at the end of many a day. But it's how you get up in the morning and say, hey, guess what? I'm going to try again. You know, real quick story. You know, I'm very proud of being Lone Star Conference champion. Yes, it was Division Two. Yes, it doesn't, you know, wasn't Division One. But you know, I grew up in New Brunswick without a single tennis lesson, and I went to Texas, and I kicked ass within my division. Yes. And the sole reason I did that was, it was definitely not because I was the best player. It's because I did everything I could to never make the same mistake twice. And that doesn't, didn't mean that I didn't make another mistake, but was, at least I was going to make a different mistake. And uh, so... If you're not perfect, who cares? Because I, I sure as hell ain't. Um, and it's realizing that tomorrow's another day and you have another opportunity to try to be a little bit better. Absolutely. If you're not failing or making mistakes, yeah. maybe you're so, not trying hard enough. You know, it's not your grades. Um, it's not the fact that you know the capital asset pricing model. It's not that you understand, you know, uh, T strips or whatever the hell it was that you guys use, uh, you, you know. T strips. Double entry, <laughs> oh, okay. You know, Sorry, double, entry book, double entry bookkeeping is, <laughs> you know, a, a, a total mystery to me. So therefore, I, I've, I've made a every accounting prop is going to have a good joke for the next five years. Uh, whatever White Shoals model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever about the White Shoals model. Yeah, uh, oh, passion, passion trumps everything. Passion trumps everything. Rick, I um, when I think about our podcast together and I think about our times together, I, I look at this quote from Hunter S. Thompson. Um, I had it on my phone from before, but it, I just want to read it quickly now. Life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. Well, thank you. For, uh, for... <laughs> Pardon thank me. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a ton of fun as always. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate you coming on. What My a buddy. ride. <laughs>